Right. Well, this is more liberty now. It's uh, I'm George, of course, and with me today is Joel. Joel, Joel Williamson. Anthony Williamson, the agorist of Austin. <laughs> <laughs> Joel, what all do you do down there in Austin? Um, I really just organize events monthly for Alliance of Austin Agorists. Um, recently, I've been working with with Jack Shimmick, as we were talking about earlier, on uh, uh, doing an Alt Expo, an alternative exposition in Austin. Mm -hmm. And um, now I'm starting to do this with you. And also with Jack, we're thinking about um, reviving New Libertarian. That's sort of the projects that I've been focus fo focusing on lately. Have you heard of New Libertarian, um, Conkin's old publication? Oh no, I've only heard of New Libertarian Manifesto. I didn't know there was a, a it's, it's a magazine article. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, it was like a, it's a quarterly magazine. It's pretty interesting stuff. We're thinking about reviving that. Maybe I shouldn't have said that, but we're thinking about reviving. <laughs> Too late. You've reached <laughs> one person. <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh yeah, so I I uh, I met Joel. I met you, Joel, when you invited me to um, uh, like talk with you guys. You 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 have a, a kind of big and active agorist group there in Austin, and uh, I guess that was last year, and uh, and that was really cool. Um, it was really, and I think actually people who want to organize, not just agorist, but any kind of libertarian meetup in any city, could learn a lot from Joel, because. He brings in like a big group, and then he brings in speakers. Uh, you know, people to talk with. Not it's not not like you sit there and give a speech. You, it's a conversation, mm. and uh, and it's re it's a really dynamic thing. It reminds me of Agro.io, which I did uh, back in 2010, 2011. I don't know if um, you you ever saw one of those, Joel. But yeah, those I, things. I really, oh yeah, those things yeah. got you know those kinds of online things where you have a group of people in person, and then a few people. Uh, or then you know one or more people online that can get really dynamic. That can really get people uh, excited. Yeah, I think so. And actually, you had something to do with um, shaping the direction that uh, the alliance is is uh, going in. And uh, originally uh, started doing. You threw the idea out there of of having the counter economic farmers market, and we've been doing it every month. Oh, cool. Since. So not awesome. only are we meeting and and interviewing and having conversations with, with experts, but are also in the background having counter-economic farmers markets for all product skills and services. So That's are, excellent. That's yeah. excellent. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's nice to have, I've been to meetups before where people, you know, hang out and talk and, and there are people give talks and stuff, and that is awesome. Mm -hmm. But when you can go to a meetup and, you know, I haven't, I, unfortunately I haven't been to Austin yet, but I would like to go at some point and go to one of those meetups. But when you can go to a meetup where um, you know people practice the philosophy that you're talking about, um, right. that's unique. That's that's special. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's that that's the that's the goal. I mean, is to not only educate but to give people an area to at least experiment in you know different counter economic um, activity. Mm-hmm. And we've been successful so far. We have all kinds of people down there, you know, people who are um, giving stuff away or bartering or trading in alternative currencies. Sort of the unspoken rule is that it's, um, you know, just between us. None of it is licensed necessarily. Mm -hmm. And um, if it is, it's, you know, they're transacting in gray. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's um, uh, about as free as it gets. That's awesome. So, um, for anybody who watched the first episode of the Mortal Liberty Now podcast, um, you may have noticed that we weren't uh, reading from script. We're not reading from scripts this time. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I get billions of ideas, and I, I often try them all, all out. You know, sometimes it's not a good idea to try them all out. <laughs> but, yeah, the scripts just came off kind of wooden. So, um, you know, Joel, Jim, John, and I... Uh, we just kind of decided, you know, we're going to go more free form, and we're going to, you know, get more than two people in on each podcast. We'll have some guests and stuff, so, uh, you know, listeners can expect it to get a little raucous. I think. You know. Yeah. <laughs> well, I like this. It's a, it's, it's more conversational. It's more fluid. It's, it's, it's uh, easier to digest and listen to. 
Yeah, yeah. So our topic today is uh, agorism. Um, what is agorism to you? How would you sum it up? You know, in in a few words. Well, sure. I I always like to start off with the textbook definition, and then try to break down all the liberty jargon after that. So uh -huh. I've memorized the definition uh, given in uh, agorism.info, which is uh, the ideology which asserts that the libertarian philosophical position occurs in the real world through the practice of counter-economics. Mm -hmm. And counter-economics can be defined as every non-coercive or non-violent act done in defiance of the state. And if you're not familiar with all the liberty jargon, basically what that means is instead of um, using parliamentary political means to achieve um, libertarian ends, um, Agorism asks us to uh, talk the talk and walk the walk and um, create alternative market institutions that people can opt into. And this is as a multi-generational goal to evolve past the state. So Konkin in the 70s, Samuel Edward Konkin III, who is from Canada, uh, you know, came down to the states arguably where he found libertarianism and started out like a a lot of us anarchists do, something of a minarchist, you know, and mm -hmm. thought that we, he could vote his way to freedom. And then I guess something clicked one day and he realized that libertarianism meant nothing without the principle of consistency. So if, if our goal is to have a, a truly freed market, it seems logical enough to use market means to achieve those ends. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I usually say, um, you know, agorism is basically trading outside the state sphere, you know, the state-approved sphere, as much as possible um, to develop kind of a, to develop the counter-economy, which is basically people uh, trading, you know, engaging in free trade and building up an alternative power base um, that is competing with the state system. Mm -hmm. So, um, with the idea eventually that that alternative power base, that alternative economy, is going to become strong enough so that we can challenge uh, the state system for um, autonomy, for our autonomy, for everyone's autonomy. And hopefully, you know, it can get to the point where, uh, you know, as some minarchists like to say, you know, we can just you know put the government in a, in a bathtub and strangle it. <laughs> but uh, you know, agorism is does contemplate um, an end strategy where there's violence, where you know it's like the government is is there, like, hey, these guys are like getting out of control. Uh, they're not you know paying their taxes and stuff. It's time for us to clamp down. And the agorists are like, hey, we're finally strong enough, you know, that we can repel this uh, this violence. And, you sure. know, it's a short shooting war and, uh, you know, a traditional kind of shooting civil war almost. Um, so I think agorism kind of uh, contemplates that end game. although, you know, I, I have a uh, preference for nonviolence, and I hope it doesn't get to that. You know, I hope that we can do it, um, you know, surely, not too slowly, but definitely surely and uh, gradually, and uh, so that it doesn't come to that. Sure. Well, I mean, we all know, or anyone who believes in the non-aggression principle knows that initiatory violence is really the kind that should be morally opposed and and not uh, defensive hmm. violence. I mean, because, you know, if you're doing it to defend yourself, that seems pretty legitimate to me. And I understand there's, you know, a debate between pacifists and uh, non-aggressionist, but but really, I think that's I think that's the agorist position is the the non-aggression um, position, which it sounds scary, you know, to people when you're describing agorism, uh, which I, I think you described it in a great way. But sometimes when you're talking about, you know, later on down the road there might be this big fight. They're like, "What are you talking about?" You know, it's like <laughs> I don't want anything to do with this. Um, <laughs> But I well, guess it's funny. I think with anything, really, that's a possibility. Sure. Because whether it's education, um, whether it's you're educating everybody and they're opting out, <clears throat> whether it's um, you know we're voting uh, for you know liberty candidates and we're starting to win, 
uh, at any time the you know the statist uh, the core the core of the state people in that core leaders political leaders or whatever they can be like hey these guys are having too much success we right. got uh, you know we got to put that that boot on their face you know for a little while to cool this thing down and then you know and I think at the end of the day. You know, people uh, whine these theories about you know natural rights and and all and all this. But honestly, I think at the end of the day, liberty comes from your ability to defend it. And um, as much as I uh, admire uh, what people like Gandhi and uh, Martin Luther King have done, um, you know, I think that even nonviolent their nonviolence is based on an ability to to be violent. You know. And, and you choose the nonviolence, but you have to have that strength to say, and the willingness to say, okay, well, to this line and no more. Whereas in today's society, we keep, we keep, we for a hundred years we've been saying to this line, no more. Oh, okay, wait, to this line and no more. Oh, wait, right. oh, okay, yeah, right. Right, of course. We of keep course. seeding ground. Yeah, and what I, what I think is 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 uh, challenging about agorism. Um, but inspiring in the same way is is uh, not trying to figure out where that line is, but making it for yourself, mm. um, and not necessarily the line with violence, you know, but the the line of of um, measuring risk and profit, or um, doing a, a revolutionary act, you know. I mean, when is it? When is God on our side? You know, that's that's something that C Cody Wilson is sort of in. I've been inspired by Cody Wilson to believe is you can't wait for a third party to tell you when the next uh, uh, when it's right to make the next move you know you kind of just have to do it yourself and measure risk and profit along the way um, mm -hmm. that, that's what I think at least <laughs> definitely yeah and I, I've had people write to me and you know kind of be like well you know I like this uh, agorism thing and uh, I really want to do it, but uh, you know, how do you handle like registering your business and paying taxes and stuff like that? <laughs> yeah, well, not every business is is easy to do it in a counter-economic way. Hmm. And not every person has the risk profile for it, I think. But also, I think that you know we have to be fluid. Like some people will say, well, if you registered your business and you're paying taxes, you're not an agorist. Um, and you know, by the book, that's true. But I don't know. I think we have to be a little bit fluid and say that, you know, we we have to look kind of like at a long tail of it. You know, at the front yeah. of, of the of the line are the people who are like the people are doing business at Silk Road. They are really agorists, you know, because they're doing it totally off the books and and secretly, and they're really they're taking a lot of a lot of risk. But at the at the far end of the tail, I think you have small business people. Mm -hmm. um, you know who may even be you know highly legal. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, Konkin pointed out five likely phases of uh, the revolution or our peaceful evolution, and um, I think that in the phase that we're in right now, education is extremely important. Um, and I also think that it's totally legitimate um, to have, especially again with certain types of. Uh, um, products and stuff, it's just difficult to do it. Sorry, I'm trying to plug in my computer at the same time. It's just difficult to do it in a completely counter-economic fashion. It, it's almost impossible sometimes. Um, but I, I think it's totally legitimate to have a white market business and, and you know still transact a little bit in gray, especially in the phase that we're in. Because really, at the end of the day, every business does that. What mm. business reports everything 100%? No business does that. Mm. I don't, I've never heard of one anyways. Well, and also, if you don't build a business, how are you ever going to have one that's gray market, right? Like, if you say, well, I'm waiting for the perfect confluence of circumstances so that I can build my business in the gray market 100%, right? It's mm -hmm. kind of a perfectionist or a fundamentalist attitude. Um, you can't really do that right now. It's, or it's, at least it's very risky, you know, and if you're married and you have kids and mortgage and all that, it it just that's not a smart move, you know, because you have to take care of yourself first. Yeah. And so if you go out and you build that white uh, white market business, you know, in the state approved market, and you fill out your your paperwork and triplicate and all that stuff, well, and you build that business, which is not easy, then at least someday, you know, as things start improving, 
um, you know, you can transition that into the gray market. Sure. Right. I mean, then you have something. You have so, you have a, a contribution that you can make, a potential one that can happen at the right time when we reach the right stage. Boom! You just move it into the uh, gray market, and you know you you or you do it gradually. Even you just reduce gradually reduce how much uh, compliance um, you know you're giving to governments and how much paperwork you're filling out and all that stuff. Yeah, I think that sounds great. And then there's the the counter argument to that, I guess, which is um, you know you're risking a lot less if you never get involved to begin with. So an example of that maybe is. Um, you know, if you've had a white market job where, and you file your taxes every single year, they know exactly how much you make. You've been on the books for 20 years. They know how much uh, that you know, to, what to expect as far as your income goes. And then you just drop off one day. You know, what I mean, that's kind of that's a red flag. So if you, but if you if you didn't pay taxes from the beginning, you know what I mean. If you start early, um, then you're less likely to to have that red flag. Um, waived and more likely to achieve the goal of of being financially free in the counter economy. That's true. Is That's measuring true. Both, both of those things, I suppose. But mm -hmm. I like to I like to see it uh, agorism, and in two ways. Uh, I like to see it in a sort of micro way, uh, where people, I guess the layman maybe, can find ways to find financial freedom in the counter economy outside of the tax and regulated state capitalist market and um, you know find ways to individually secede and uh, then there's macro agorism which is sort of um, you know these market institutions like Bitcoin or Silk Road that have a real challenge that challenge the state directly and in a really big noticeable way um, I don't know if you read that article that showed that the emergence of the Silk Road, there's a correlation uh, with that and a decrease in violence in the in drug trade. But that's an immediate example of of the positive, peaceful impact we can have on people now. I saw that. I saw that headline. Yeah, I didn't read the article, but um, you know, I think that's that's definitely interesting. And you know, I just wonder: is, do you really think Silk Road is big enough that it could have that kind of an impact? I think so. It's huge. It's huge. So many people use it, and Silk Road isn't the only online drug market either. You know, there's, and it won't be the only one. So if if somehow the cops figured out how to to shut it down. It doesn't mean that's the end of online drug trading. Mm -hmm. In fact, that creates a, an entrepreneurial opportunity for people to figure out how to get around uh, the ways that the state figured out how to shut down the last business. You know. So um, Rothbard, who is uh, you know kind of popular in in libertarian circles, he ha he basically thought agorism was uh, complete. Foolishness, nonsense, because um, most people have jobs. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. most people work for a living, and agorism kind of requires you to take an entrepreneurial, um, you know, attitude towards things. Uh, what What do you think about that? Do you think you know agorism is relevant? You know, the entrepreneurial kind of, um, um, you know, mandate is relevant to uh, the population at large. Yeah, I think it is relevant. Actually, I don't think that Rothbard has been any more wrong um, with anything that he's ever said. His critique of agorism, I felt, was extremely weak. I mean, he point he he tries to make the argument that your average uh, you know uh, wage earner isn't going to be interested in not working for a boss. And it's like, whoa, whoa what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Like if it, mm. I'm I'm shining example of that. If anything, you know, I mean, that's why agorism spoke to me directly. I love the idea of entrepreneurship. Mm. Uh, have I achieved that fully? Probably not. But I mean, I I like the idea, and it definitely speaks to me. And that's the point. And as he was trying to say, it wouldn't speak yeah. to to your average worker. I I think there definitely is a large class of people out there who work. Uh, at jobs, and they don't conceive of any other way of working. And I know I grew up, I, I actually grew up, one side of my family, my mom's side, is very entrepreneurial. And the other side, my dad's side, is very employment-oriented. 
so much mm -hmm. so that after I graduated from, uh, I mean, I don't, you know, it's just a fact. I'm not trying to brag, but I graduated from the one of the best uh, colleges in the country, and my stepmother said to me, uh, probably advice that uh, she got through my dad. She said to me, "You should get a government job. You know, they can't <laughs> fire you. It pays okay. The benefits are good. You know." And I just kind of like face palmed, <laughs> uh, you know. And that that's so typical of that side of the family. Actually, a lot of them work for um, government and universities and other big institutions. And there are people like that who, and I I grew up kind of seeing how they think, and it's like they you know they think well that's for other people, uh, mm -hmm. that's too risky. I don't have the money for that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't even know how to go about it. I hate you know all the paperwork. You know it's funny they work for governments, but they hate the, hate the paperwork. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I think that Rothbard has a small point. You know that a lot of people aren't interested in 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 that. They're scared by it. But I also think that with things that are happening, just general trends in the in the economy, that people aren't going to have much of a choice because a lot of work is being replaced and uh, will be replaced in the future even more with automation, you know, in the form of, um, you know, robots and mostly software. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's accurate. You know, your story of, uh, just to uh, backtrack a little bit, your story of your, your family encouraging you to go into a political office makes me laugh because I can't tell you how many times I've like had a conversation where, and maybe it's my my fault for not communicating, uh, you know, efficiently. But you know, I'm just talking about how horrible the government is, and here's an awesome solution, agorism, and they're just sort of superficially nodding their head, and then they're like, "You should run for office." <laughs> it's like, You're not. You don't get it. Mm. You don't get it. But I mean, what's the alternative to agorism? Reformism, gradualism. You know what I mean? And that's, I think, probably another huge, I mean, why I disagree with Rothbard's critique so much. I mean... Hey, we, we just have to get the right candidates into office, Joel. That's all. I know. I know. Rand Paul 2016 will be that much closer to a free society. We're going to reduce government to its appropriate size and then magically eliminate it one day. Yes, yes, yes. No, that's but Rand point. Paul, no, sorry, Adam Kokesh. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, man. I was very, very sad to hear that he was running for office. I don't know if he still is or if he's, he's serious about it. Hmm. But I just, I really couldn't believe it, especially someone who had been talking about agorism so much. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's just like, I don't know. I think he's sort of, I've learned a lot from him. I have, but I think he's, in a way, maybe doesn't understand agorism fully. You know, I've, it's it's the answer to gradualism, you know. Mm. It's it doesn't it's not a, a in partnership with it. You know, I, I think gradualists don't understand a basic fact of life, which is something a lot of us learned in storybooks when we were a kid. Is when you um, you know, if you want to get to the stars, <clears throat> you got to aim. Not if you want to get to the stars. What is it? If you want to, you know, if you want to fly. Mm -hmm. You got to aim at the stars, you know. You got to be like, no, I don't want to just get to the sky. I want to fly to the moon, you know. Mm -hmm. Because whatever your aim is, you're only going to achieve half or a quarter of it or whatever, you know. And you're going to fail a lot. And so if you set your sights too low, you know, if you just say, well, I want to fly, you know, I just want to fly over there. Well then, you, it's not. It doesn't. It's not motivating. It's not a goal where it changes everything. It's just like, eh, you know. And so you're not going to put out the maximum effort. Whereas if you say, I want to fly to, um, you know, Mars. Well, that's a big goal, and you know, pr probably some of the people who worked on, um, you know, getting uh, people on on the moon. Probably some of them were thinking, I want to get to Mars, you know, but yeah. first, got to get to the moon. And so they were like, let's shoot for Mars, but we got to the moon. Okay, well, at least you made some progress. Yeah. But people who say, well, we just have to repeal a few laws and reduce the tax rate to 10%, well, that, that doesn't motivate anybody. Everybody's like, eh. You know, so yeah. nobody does anything to achieve that goal. It's just slithering along every year, being reactionary, and ceding the initiative to the people who are growing government. Right. 
I mean, even I think that's a I think that's a great metaphor. I mean, but just even practically speaking, you know, I don't think you have to go any further than looking at um, what parliamentary what the parliamentary process is. You know what I mean? Actually, all you'd have to do is look at who politicians are. You know, like is it, the way I see it, I guess you've got basically three types of politicians. I guess one is um, uh, the sociopath who is attracted to state power, right? The classic sociopath mm -hmm. who, who wants the, the gun in the room. Uh, two, there is the good old boy who hasn't been corrupted by state power yet, um, but eventually is. Okay, and then there's three, mm -hmm. the one who seems like they may not ever be corrupted, who has who may experience relative success in uh, peeling back restrictive laws. And I'm against all three, even the third one. I mean, because if you think about it, what is, what is um, getting rid of re restrictive laws really do? It, can, it, 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 it makes sure that the state in the long run maintains its existence. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It only mm -hmm. makes the, the, the it water... It lets pressure off the pot. Right, exactly. And people are like, yeah, we made progress. It works. Right. Right. Yeah, frogs. Well, what we say is frogs don't belong in pots, right? <laughs> I mean, I see us as a, I see us as frogs in a, a boiling pot of water and an evil cook who's slowly turning up the heat. And some of us frogs are noticing, hey, this is getting really hot. Let's tell the cook to turn it down. Mm. So we yell at the cook, look, you got to turn this down. You know, never realizing that the cook's interest and the frog's interest are completely different. Hmm. So the cook turns it down a little bit, makes it a little bit more comfortable. Well, the agorist frog says, Ho hold on, what are we doing in a pot to begin with? You know? Yeah. Jump out when the cook isn't looking. Hey, so let's bring this uh, the agorism thing down to earth, yeah? <clears throat> so people, that maybe there's someone listening who's like, okay, agorism, this sounds interesting, yeah? It's totally different from other things that I've heard about, you know? Uh, like you compare it to voting or you know gradualism gradually changing laws and things and that always bored me and you know educating people and living your own life that's awesome but seems kinda slow this agorism thing sounds like you know I could have some fun while I'm doing it but how do I do it yeah so what's you know in, in your group there in Austin what's kinda like the first step some people take um, towards you know um, counter counter economic activity. Sure. Well, I mean the the short answer would would be now that you know what counter economics is, go out and do it. But of course that's not specific enough. So I mean, really, it's just uh, measuring risk and profit, and uh, attempting to secede individually or you know as a as a collective. Mm -hmm. And um, there's, I could point out so many things, but I mean, one obvious one is is if you do have a white market job, um, experiment with side projects. Um, you know, whether it's candle making, like I do, and with t-shirts also, um, or it's lawn care, or guitar lessons, or uh, gun safety training, or anything like that. Those are all small ways that you can find financial freedom in the counter economy and experiment with as a business. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, and on the side, and there's one benefit of having a white market job and um, side projects is uh, that it, 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 it gives the illusion of you not actually doing anything revolutionary. You know what I mean? I've got my part-time white market job. I'm not doing anything. Don't look over here. Well, in the meantime, that's really just a front for all the income you're getting in the counter economy. And I could I could list a, a million different, you know, business ideas, but I think that's really just gonna be up to who what people are interested in, you know, whether it be lawn care or or uh, you know artisan craft work, house cleaning, Bitcoin knowledge training, you know, anything of the sort. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I I would say, you know, a first, a real easy, relatively easy and very clear cut, clear, uh, clear cut first, you know, agorist action you can take is to uh, do some work for Bitcoin or buy some Bitcoin or spend some Bitcoin um, mm -hmm. because 
you know, even though, you know, like if you spend Bitcoin at Overstock.com, for example, they're going to just translate that back into dollars and they're going to report it and they're going to pay taxes on it and all that. But um, by moving more commerce into Bitcoin, uh, it puts more power into people's hands because, you know, when the day arrives that uh, people, you know, expand the reach of our power and we can stop reporting income or, um, you know, pay, pay less taxes or pay zero taxes on it, if we have that wealth in Bitcoin, if we're transacting in Bitcoin, well, boom, it's uh, opaque to the authorities. And so we can do it immediately. And also by trading in Bitcoin, by buying and selling in it, it uh, bumps up the transaction activity of the network and that, you know, it just strength, strengthens it. As more yeah. people get used to using it, as more people see that how much it's being used, uh, it creates the demand for it, and so it may even inch up the price. Not that the price of Bitcoin is important uh, per se, but I think it is important to use cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, um, you know, because uh, it is totally independent of governments. I mean, it really is an agorist uh, currency. Yeah, uh, people. Yeah, people may still report their agri their uh, their Bitcoin earnings and all that stuff, but still, that's vol that's their decision. Right, um, and it's so easy not to. Also, mm. <laughs> if you do report it, it's so easy <laughs> to not report the majority of what you're doing. Yeah, that's, it's like the same thing as working in cash, but you know, even better because it's easier. Yeah, and I would also say, you know, speaking of cash, you know, pay cash when you can. Uh, I know here uh, where I live in South America, uh, frequently when I pay cash, um, the I don't get a receipt because I know that business owner um, is is not going to report that, you know. Right. And actually, underground, you know, I think the underground economy is uh, not as well known in the United States, but it's pretty common, uh, a pretty common term, pretty common concept in the third world. Right. And it's pretty big, and it's pretty much synonymous with agorism. Uh, oh, yeah. I know, yeah, I know here where I live in in, in Colombia, uh, it's giant. It's yeah. giant. And some of the and some other ways you can support um, you know, you can kind of take agorist actions are to buy food at a farmers market. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Uh, what else was I going to say? Uh, and as far as earning money, as far as working in um, the counter economy, just kind of break through your preconceptions. Try not to think of it as a job, but try to think of it as um, what do people need? You know, for example, like even just take it from your own life. Uh, what do you need? Like a lot of people buy furniture from IKEA, mm -hmm. and then it has to be assembled. And you don't always want to pay the IKEA guy or wait for the IKEA. Guy. I'm pretty sure IKEA offers an assembly service. I, I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, but but the official service can be delayed and it can be expensive. So you set up a service to assemble these things for people. Yeah. Yeah. And or and there are also services like TaskRabbit, and there's another one. There's uh, Uber and Lyft. Lyft. Yep. And so all this stuff, you know, it's not like a hundred percent agorist, but it's kind of trending in that direction. And these are the kinds of things that you can participate in. Uh, to strengthen the counter economy, I think. Sure. What do you think? I think I think that's excellent. And um, actually, you know, if you, if you already do have a white market business, you can do. Well, I'm sure you already have practice in, in not reporting everything, or working in cash more. I, I mean, business owners know this firsthand how much regulations suck, right? And I won't mention it, but I know a business offhand here in Austin that um, often asks people if they'd like to um, go around giving Rick Perry a cut on the transaction and in turn they don't receive a receipt for what they purchase mm -hmm. but totally you know transacting as individuals has nothing to do with any other entity outside of that trade mm. you know so I mean businesses are already doing it if you're not doing it that's one great way to to hint at people that you do want to transact in a counter-economic way is just ask them if they if they don't want to give Rick Perry their cut. I live in Texas, by the way, so uh -huh. that's that's why they say that. But um, no, I think that's totally true, man. And uh, you know, for you know, if for example, 
I see a lot of parallels between um, agorism and uh, Ayn Rand, you know, an Atlas Shrugged. So mm -hmm. I think there is, uh, you know, it's not 100% compatible, but there, for example, what were those guys doing in Galt's Gulch? I don't know if you've read Atlas Shrugged. I've read it a few times, actually. Yeah. But at, at the end of the story, these guys are, are in Galt's Gulch, and they're shrugging. They're, they've left the state economy, and they're building a new economy. Mm -hmm. and purposely withdraw their support for the state economy so it'll collapse more quickly. And that's kind of what agorism is. Uh, it's kind of like leaving, not necessarily physically, but uh, perhaps mentally at first, leaving the state economy and going off and building um, you know, an alternative to it to build up uh, you know, uh, freed markets instead of state-controlled markets. I like that. You used freed also, I, I assume, or I just heard. Yeah, uh huh. Free. First, yeah. first chapter like in market, markets, not capitalism. It is really a great tip that he gave there to support a freed market, not the free market, which even you know has been tainted by rightists and leftists, status mm. leftists. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to sidetrack. No, not at all. Um, so, but there, there is one thing, perhaps controversial, that I want to um, get in. A lot of people say that gardening is an example of agorism, and I have, um, you know, stirred up a little controversy by saying I don't think gardening is actually an example of agorism, unless you're treating it as a business, you know, and you're going out and selling your produce, and and it's uh, a good use of your time, you know, like a core competency. Competency. Mm -hmm. I think that gardening. Some people see gardening. As awesome as it is, you know, it's awesome to garden and it's awesome to have fresh food and all that um, that you grew. But I think gardening is more of like a voluntarious thing, you know, to kind of um, what is it, nitpick, <laughs> sure, um, split hairs, because it's more of like a withdrawing thing, you know. Right. And it's not. I think with agorism, and I think this might illuminate a little bit. Um, with agorism, you have to be producing something. You have to be. Uh, taking a risk, putting a product out there on the market, uh, offering something for sale. And so mm -hmm. if you're just, uh, you know, if you're doing the whole self-sufficiency thing, that's awesome. But that's kind of an economic dead end because it, it defeats the whole specialization of labor thing. And, um, you know, it's kind of like inward looking. Whereas I think agorism is more of, and self-sufficiency is a more uh, rural thing. Whereas I think agorism is a more of an urban thing, a more of a trade and exchange thing, and uh, requires that people network and form communities and whatnot um, in order, you know, because with transactions, you have to have trust, and right. you have to know the reputation of the person you're doing, uh, you're doing business with, and that requires, um, you know, the people are dealing with each other a lot, and I don't know, what do you, what's your take on that? Well, I mean, I, I see gardening, gardening as maybe like an example of, of micro-gorism, I suppose. Um, I mean, because if the... Well, it's true that, you know, gorism is sort of rooted in, you know, Austrian economics and, um, you know, private exchange and whatnot. I think that if the counter-economy is a sum total of, of all voluntary human interaction, and if... if, if I mean, I mean that's that's a huge umbrella to work under, and what what I find so appealing about agorism is that it's eclectic, right? So I mean, there's mm -hmm. there's room for all types of anarchists, proprietarian and 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 not, um, all working together against the state. So I mean, while gardening um, may not be a a huge example of a counter economic activity, I think it it's it's fully, I mean, I think it fully fits. And you know the counter-economic realm. You know, um, it, it may not be a huge thing to to end the state, but it is one thing you can do to lessen your dependency on the white market, which is really what we're trying to evolve past. You know, um, so I, I think it's compatible. It, it's not extreme, but it's compatible. Well, I think it's definitely. I think it's compatible with a whole bunch of things. I just think that it's not really accurate to call it agorism because it, it's kind of it, it extinguishes trade 
you know. Um, and I think that some people take the whole self-sufficiency thing kind of in a prepper direction, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to be able to produce everything that I use. And uh, I think that's definitely, like, uh, in conflict with, you know, it's more populist than it really is, um, you know, freed markets kind of a thing or, you know, exchange thing. It's, it's more like, you know, I can't trust anybody, so I'm going to do everything myself. And then, okay, well, everybody's doing everything themselves. You know, if you, sure. if you take that to a societal level... Uh, everybody's standard of living is going to collapse. Yeah, I don't think like isolationism is is an example. Of, yeah, like, isolationism. Of, yeah, of, of a smart counter-economic thing we should do. I mean, I think again, if the counter-economy is a sum total of all voluntary acts done in defiance of the state, I think there's there's a lot of room there. You know what I mean? For all types of civil disobedience, non-controversial and controversial. I don't think that all all um, everything in the counter-economy is is necessarily um, a good thing, though, either. You know, I mean, um, I think that agorism obviously focuses on outside the system activism versus inside the system activism. And, and another example, just to nitpick also, um, would be um, instead of focusing our attention on, you know, chasing cops around all day, mm -hmm. uh, maybe we should develop an app to track these guys to, to not challenge them directly, but just to move around them. You know, mm. I've, I've got all kinds of respect for, for Cop Block, Peaceful Streets Project. Those guys are great. But it's a debate, I think it's a relevant debate that we should be having. You know, do we want to focus our time, money, and energy on, on filming cops all day, or do we want to develop technology that enable us, enables us to avoid them? That is a brilliant idea. Uh, you know, people say uh, the, in the, the strength of the Internet is that, you know, where there's control, you can, at least in theory, it doesn't always work that way with the corporate-controlled Internet, but you can just route or treat it as damage and route around it, you know. And so that your idea is kind of like applying that to the real world. Treat cops, you know, control as damage and route around it. Um, right. That's a great idea. I have reservations, too, about that whole cop block and confrontation thing. Um, you know, I, I, I agree. I, I think sometimes it's, it's pointless. It's like an ego thing, a, a dick measuring contest, and um, it's not always productive. And even the, the brand of Cop Block, you know, as much as I admire Pete and uh, Adam and, and, and all the people all involved right. in that. As sexual, it's, it's obviously an innuendo. <laughs> but it's, 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 um, it's, it's not constructive. What is Cop Block building? You know, I, there's no, there's nothing implicit in that brand that says we're building something. It says we're blocking stuff, we're destroying, we're stopping. Yeah. Right. right. And I think to have a successful brand, it has to imply that you're building something. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're gonna, if you're gonna destroy something, if you're gonna stop something, then that's secondary. You always have to make your pot, your focus positive. It always has to be, you know, that we're building something. Um, and then, well, we have to destroy this in the process, right? But, but the focus, at least the brand, the marketing, should be on building something. And I don't see anywhere for the cop block brand to go to say that they're building something. Right. Well, I mean, they're building people's knowledge of police brutality, which I think is excellent. You know, and then that, that can inspire you then to go out and create an alternative to where you don't have to film cops anymore. So I think it's like a, I think it's a great first step, and it is valuable in an educational sense. Uh, just like a you know nobody don't vote for me for president campaign could be, um, but that's not maybe where we want to focus all of our time on always. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I I, yeah, I agree I, though. I just, no, just want to say really quick that's not my idea. Um, it's not a, an idea. I didn't make that up. I actually have an app on my phone called Waze, where you can report a report uh, speed traps and, and whatnot. Uh -huh. um, but, I mean, it. I think it's. it'd be great to see that technology sort of developed into more private, trust trusted way, sort of decentralized, mm -hmm. um, instead of, you know... Imagine if, like, an underground organization planted, um, you know, like, um, really small, uh, micro, uh, what's it called, um, G -P GPS transmitters on every police car. Yeah, and they made an app. They made an app to, um, you know, to keep track of that. 
you know, I don't you see anything see wrong with that. If you can get away with it, it I mean, it's all about measuring risk and profit. I think that's an excellent idea. And actually, if you could, if you could do that and implement it successfully, I think a lot of our problems would be solved. Well, it'd be a constant <laughs> war, you know. It'd be a constant war because then the police would check and they'd be like, "Hey, they they got they got one on ours," you know. Again. And then, and then they'd be they'd have to waste a lot of time and money putting their car through the ringer trying to find it, you know, and hopefully, you know, technology will permit there to be really small ones. Um and uh but then, you know, so okay, hey, we got it off, you know, but they're slow, it's a bureaucracy and you know, we're agile, so they got it off, okay, we realize it's off. All right, we'll put another one on is in that, a different is, spot. Camouflaged as something else. Is that your idea? Is that an original idea? Well, I don't know. I don't know. But I, I don't remember hearing it from I think that's else, genius. <laughs> you should take that one ideas right? work, you know. It's like somebody says something and somebody says something else. And, I'm not, and it, it's, you know, so it's, I think it's, it can be, it's, I don't know. But whatever. I, I, I think that would be, that. I think, but I, I'm building on your idea anyway. Which right. You, you were building on somebody else's anyway, and too. So anyway. Sure. But I, I, I think that that can be really cool and that could be constructive. And it could be, uh, you know, like a whole, uh, you know, like James Bond kind of operation, too. Yeah. I think as long as you're, again, measuring risk and profit and attempting to do it covertly, not overtly, and not do what uh, Jack Schimmick calls train wreck activism, mm. which, again, to go back to, unfortunately, to go back to, to uh, Adam, you know, loading a shotgun in a gun-free zone may not be the best way to educate people of gun rights. Um, yeah, so I think it, he painted himself into a corner there, you know, because he came out with that the radical thing about the march, and then, and then of course, any, anytime you you know, I have my problems with Adam, but I do have to give him props. I mean, he came out with a radical idea, and he he had the courage to do that, and then he had the courage to at least take it to a certain point. Be, uh, even in the face of all the you know the haters and the griefers and the Jimmy wrestlers and all that, because any time you come out with something that's radical um, or just really excellent, like it provokes envy and and a counter reaction from other people, mm -hmm. and, um, and so I think it takes courage to do that. But oh, sure. yeah, I think that he uh, in the end um, he let himself be caught up by the ego of the thing, you know, of having to feel like he had to carry through, and on not having good people to advise him, you know. Like somebody should have said to him, dude, that's a really bad idea. Don't do that, you know. But right. I, don't think, I don't think anybody around him that knew about it said anything to, like that to him. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think, his, I think his purpose was to was to educate, but I think there's better ways of educating and and just with respect, I just disagree with that that sort of that sort of tactic. I don't I don't think it gets anywhere because we we can do a lot more. And I think you you probably said this is where I got this idea. You can, we can do a lot more outside of a jail cell than we can inside. Hmm. Although I think that kind of you know like um, I think that kind of activity that kind of activism has its place, but um, I think he went too far for the current context. You know. In the future, when there's a different balance of power, that kind of thing, and there are more people who are sympathetic to what libertarians are saying, or at least his brand of libertarianism, that could be quite powerful because it could be a thing to, like, if he was able to get away with it, you know, if he was able to do that and then get away with it, uh, if they if they didn't react, if their reaction was weak, that could have empowered a whole n new group of people to follow up with another wave of um, kind of ballsy stuff and you know that kind of a thing can build on itself um, and become viral and really have a huge impact but he went you know his uh, his reach exceeded his grasp there they yeah. really came down hard on him yeah that's unfortunate yeah well um, so I think yeah, we've talked for a while. Is there anything else you want to get in? Um, I guess if I could, I mean, while we're on agorism, if you don't mind, uh, maybe in conclusion, I think if, if anyone is interested in agorism or understand or want to understand how to practice counter-economics, uh, first and foremost, read New Libertarian Manifesto um, and also Agorist 
an agorist primer, or primer, however you want to pronounce it. But those are absolutely essential reads, and you shouldn't even um, try to figure out what agorism is without reading that. That's my advice. Is it, those, those are essential reads and a must to, uh, to free your mind and eventually free yourself. Excellent. And um, my cat's pushing my computer. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you can download both of those at agorism.info. Is that right? Yeah, but the, the problem with agorism.info is that it, it is up intermittently. I don't know what the deal is, if, if Brad Spangler's ignoring it or if the government's trying to shut it down on a daily basis, but it doesn't work, so it doesn't... But yes, I mean, on YouTube, you can get the free audio versions of it. It's a PDF version. It's not just agorism.info. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you can find, a, find them free online. Okay. All right, well, uh, I think this is a really good conversation. Uh, this is the More Liberty Now podcast. Um, you can find this episode uh, online at morelibertynow.com slash two. That's the number two. Uh, today it's been uh, Joel and myself. Um, it, uh, you know, it costs us money and time and whatnot, even though it's a labor of love uh, to do this podcast. So if you would like to support us, you can go to morelibertynow.com slash support. Um, you know, no pressure, but uh, you know, if if you if you want to support what we're doing, if you want to help us uh, reach more people with a practical message of liberty and this engaging, um, dynamic conversation that we are uh, launching, then um, you know it would be really awesome. Yeah. So uh, thanks, Joel. It's I've really enjoyed this conversation, and um, yeah. Until next week. All right, laissez-faire. <laughs>